how many times have you heard this? Hey, if you eat that whole big T-bone steak, that excess protein, that excess amount of that steak is going to turn to fat. Okay, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about how protein converts to fat, if it really does convert to fat, and where the threshold really is. Because we can't just have this random pseudoscience out there that leads us to believe that if we eat too much protein, we're going to automatically be fat. It's not that simple. We need to know the numbers. You are tuned into the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. New videos Tuesday, Friday, Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And a bunch of other videos throughout the week as well. I want to make sure you go ahead and hit that red subscribe button, okay? And go ahead and hit that little bell icon so you can turn on notifications. And hey, if you haven't already, check out ButcherBox down below in the description. Okay, ButcherBox delivers grass-fed, grass-finished meat directly to your doorstep for a cheaper cost than the grocery store. And because you're watching one of my videos, you get a special price on it too. So after you're done watching this video and you don't want to go to the grocery store and you want to get grass-fed, grass-finished meat, go ahead and check out ButcherBox. So again, special discount down below. Now let's go ahead and let's get straight into the science. I have to start really simple here, how protein is broken down. When we consume protein, like we consume some uh, steak or we consume some chicken or anything like that, the hydrochloric acid and an enzyme known as pepsin in our stomach break it down. Okay, it breaks it down into what are called polypeptides and eventually breaks it down into what are called amino acids. Now, amino acids you may have heard before as the building blocks of protein. Basically, multiple amino acids compile a protein. So when you eat meat, you consume the protein from the meat and then it gets broken down into amino acids. Now, what's interesting is that some of those amino acids go directly to solving a problem within the body. For example, if you have an injury, you consume protein and immediately some of those amino acids after being broken down are going to go to the source to fix that issue. But a large sum of them, usually over 50% of the amino acids that you consume, end up going into the liver. And when they go to the liver, they sort of sit in like a pool, for lack of a better term, and that pool is just there to source amino acids for whatever needs them. So for example, you've got a bunch of amino acids, broken down protein, in your liver. Then you go to the gym and you work out you start breaking down some tissue. So that tissue says, hey liver, I need to borrow some of those amino acids. I need XYZ amino acids for XYZ problem. Very, very simple. The liver sort of acts as the monitor to determine where in the body we need protein or amino acids at that point in time. Now, excess protein and its conversion to fat. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Sure, there are pathways in which protein can convert to fat. There's pathways in which carbs can turn to fat, and there's pathways in which fat can turn to fat. All things we consume have some indirect pathway to eventually turn into fat. The hard part is, with protein, it's so easy to just assume that it's going to get turned into fat really easily. Well, that ignores the results of multiple studies that are out there. So we're going to talk about those in just a second. But first of all, you have to know that excess amino acids that you consume, and excess amino acids that you don't use, go through a deamination process. And what that means is the amino acids get converted into ammonia, and then that ammonia is excreted through your urea, through your kidneys, and straight into the toilet or bush if you're out hiking. Now, if you've ever been running or anything like that, and you've done some like high endurance activity, and you kind of smell that ammonia-like smell, maybe you recognize this, or maybe you haven't like realized it before, that ammonia smell is protein that's broken down. So most of the time, the amino acids that we don't use are just deaminated and excreted. But let's go ahead and let's take a look at a study that was published in the JAMA that really made some sense of all this. So this study took a look at 25 individuals, male and female, okay, healthy individuals that weren't super active. Okay, now, that means they weren't weight training, but they were just generally healthy people that ate well. And what the study did is it took these 25 people and divided them into three groups. And each of these groups consumed 140% of their maintenance calories. So what that means is they ended up consuming about 1,000 calories more than they normally would, or 1,000 calories more than what their maintenance calorie level would be. Now, one group, they had consumed low amounts of protein. One group, they had consumed moderate amounts of protein, and another group, they had consumed high amounts of protein, all the way up to 230 grams. That's a good amount for someone that's not working out. Now, what the study wanted to look at was, okay, if we overfeed all of these people to the same degree, but with slightly different macros, who gains more fat? Like, ultimately, which macro leads to more fat accumulation? Well, the study results were pretty interesting. So what they found was that all participants gained about the same amount of body fat. Okay, so you might be wondering, well, hey, I thought you were gonna say that protein was super good. Well, no, hear me out on this, because it all makes sense, right? 
they all gain the same amount of body fat, meaning that not one particular macronutrient led to more fat accumulation than the other. Excess protein didn't lead to more fat accumulation than excess fat, and excess protein didn't lead to more fat accumulation than excess carbs even. I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? But the one thing that the excess protein did do is it contributed to a 15 to 25% increase in lean body mass. So I'm not here to just say that extra protein is good or that the carnivore diet is the only way to go or anything like that. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that a lot of these myths about excess protein being highly convertible into fat is not necessarily true. All the macros seem to be equal when we are in that much of a surplus, with protein actually yielding a side effect benefit of more lean body mass, which therefore revs up your metabolism later on down the line. So in theory, it seems as though excess protein could be good, but let's break this down a little bit more. What's really cool about this study is it was done on sedentary people. Okay, so they gained muscle without even lifting a weight. People that are working out have a higher degree of protein synthesis which we'll talk about in a second, because that higher degree of protein synthesis is going to further exacerbate how much of that protein actually gets utilized. Now, you're probably looking for concrete numbers, okay? So let me give you some of that. Ultimately, what we've found with these studies is that we are good to go to consume three to four times the recommended daily allowance of protein. Okay, so if we're told that we can consume, you know, 100 grams of protein, realistically, we could probably go upwards of 300. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should. I'm just saying that's the number before we start seeing a slight increase in the ability for that protein to turn to fat. And I'm going to make some sense of that in a second and give you some evidence on that. Okay, now let's talk about protein turnover for a second because what dictates whether or not protein will get converted to fat is someone's degree of protein turnover. Now, some of this is dictated by your genetics, but a lot of it is dictated just by your activity. So that study that I referenced, where they still gained lean body mass, had they been weight training, there's a good chance they could have gained even more lean body mass, which therefore could have brought their body fat levels lower. Okay, so protein turnover is how quickly your body has the ability to take the protein that you eat and put it to use and or break it down and excrete it. If you are slow at protein turnover, your body's slow at protein turnover, you have a higher chance of that protein getting converted into something. We'll talk about that in a second too. Okay, so protein turnover is very critical. We want that protein to either get turned into nitrogen or turned into ammonia and just leave our body. Now, where this all comes together is something known as the carbon skeletons. So amino acids, you got to think of them still as a building block of protein, but that building block of protein still has a framework. So think of a building block. I want you to picture a cube, okay? Now, inside that cube, you have the matter that makes up the cube itself, but then you have the frame of the cube that actually gives the cube structure, like a wireframe, like the rebar, okay? Well, that rebar doesn't get used. That rebar is a carbon skeleton, and that rebar doesn't really do anything other than get converted into some other kind of usable fuel. So we have two different kinds of carbon skeletons that get left over from protein. We have glucogenic skeletons and we have ketogenic skeletons. Now I don't want you to think ketogenic all about ketosis, just don't let your head go there for a second. Basically all that means is some of the skeletons from some amino acids get turned into glucose or pyruvate and some skeletons get converted into ketones or free fatty acids. It doesn't mean they get directly converted into, but they contribute to the building of, okay? It's basically spare parts for the body. Now you might be wondering, how do I eat more foods that give me ones that produce more ketones or ones that produce more glucose? Can't really control that because some of the amino acids go one way, some of the amino acids go the other. And if you eat a nice big steak, you're gonna get all those amino acids. The point is, is that our body takes these excess substrates, these excess skeletons, and it does stuff with them. It either makes ketones or it makes glucose. If they make glucose and then we are sedentary, the glucose can go through what is called de novo lipogenesis, basically where carbs turn to fat, which is already an inefficient process. So those of you that watched my video talking about how carbs don't easily convert to fat and that hated on me for that, well now it's coming to benefit for you, okay? Those carbs don't turn into fat easily. So when protein turns to carbs, it is difficult for the carbs to turn to fat. So the fact that carbs don't turn to fat easy is in our benefit when it comes down to wanting to eat a super huge steak. 
So that's all there is to it. Now, again, I talk about eating lower amounts of protein to get more fats in your diet, yada, yada. The fact of the matter is, enjoy your protein and don't overthink it. Do what works good for you. And if carnivore diet is something that you want to do, there's evidence that shows that you have probably more leniency to not gain body fat, more leniency to build muscle, more leniency to eat more calories because you're just eating meat. So this wasn't just a carnivore pitch, I just wanted to put it out there. As always, make sure that you keep it locked in here on my channel. If you have ideas for future videos, you know where to put them down in the comments, and I'll see you soon.